Hello, everyone, and welcome to Altium Academy. As you can see, I am here in the podcast studio today because we are snowed in here in Portland, Oregon right now. So I thought it would be fun to do a little video on inverted F antennas. Now, in some of our recent videos on RF design and on patch antennas, I noticed that there were a couple of questions about inverted F antennas. So that's what we're gonna talk about today in this video. Let's go ahead and get started. Now, if you've ever used an ESP8266 module, and I think there are some other microcontroller modules out there, you have probably seen a type of inverted F antenna. Now, if you start looking through the literature a little bit, or you start looking online to try and figure out how to design one of these things, you're actually gonna find limited information. And so I'm just gonna tell you up front, there are no closed form design equations that you can use to find everything that you need to find out about an inverted F antenna. But what I'm gonna show you in this video is of course what is an inverted F antenna and then some strategies that you can use to break it down and analyze it as long as you know a few things about the properties of your traces that make up your inverted F antenna. So let's hop into this presentation. So here I have on screen a drawing of a typical inverted F antenna. So of course it has the F shape and it's on its edge and it is printed directly onto the PCB. Typically the way that these are constructed is you have ground on the top layer, the ground is surrounding the feed line. The feed line is coming from your driver. Maybe it's coming from an amplifier. It's coming from some other component. And then in order to match the impedance of the feed line to the input impedance looking into the antenna, you generally have a matching network. It's generally going to be an LC network, so like a pie filter. Now on L2, you also have ground and that forms a coplanar waveguide with this trace here, with this microstrip. So you have coplanar microstrip routing. But then here above this dash line, we don't have any ground. And the reason we don't have any ground above this dash line is so that this inverted F section right here, the horizontal region where my mouse is, that way it can radiate omnidirectionally or almost totally omnidirectionally. So that's the intention of this type of design. We want to uh, make sure that of course, we have impedance matching coming in, and then we get maximum power injection into this antenna, and then it will radiate in all directions because there is no ground below this antenna section. You can do this without having the ground on the top layer. You don't have to use coplanar waveguide routing in order to bring this feed line to the antenna, but that's just a convenient way to do it, and it is typically how it's done. So if you look on any kind of antenna modules or microcontroller modules, and you see this type of routing, that's pretty typical. You can expect that on a lot of different types of routing, and you'll see it in reference designs. So what's a design process for this type of antenna? Well, first of all, you're gonna notice here that we have this lambda over four designation. And what that is telling you is that this L-shaped section running from here all the way down to the edge of this leg is a quarter wavelength. So this is a type of quarter wavelength antenna. And then here, this leg on the left that's coming back down, it does connect to this ground region. We have a direct connection here, this is shorted. And then here on this side, this is open, so it's not connecting to anything. That is very important because we can use that a little bit later in a circuit model to learn a little bit more about the input impedance of this antenna. So a design process. First things first, we need to pick a frequency that we're gonna operate at. And then of course we wanna calculate this quarter wave because this quarter wavelength here is going to determine the size of the antenna that we need. First, we would have to of course pick a stack up and a material set. Then we would wanna determine the impedance of our feed line based on that uh, stack up and material set. So we would want to determine this feed line impedance. Generally, the drivers that you're going to use, whether it's from like an RF capable microcontroller or a power amplifier, are going to be matched to 50 ohms. So then you're going to want to determine a 50 ohm sizing for this trace. Then you can design the antenna and determine the antenna impedance, and then of course determine any impedance matching. So the challenge here is, as I said before, there are no simple closed form design equations for this antenna. There are little pieces that you can look at, but there is no single group of equations that tells you absolutely everything about this antenna, unfortunately. 
Now let's take a look at what equations are available to deal with some of these design points. I think it would be natural to just look at this and say, oh, this antenna is constructed from microstrips, so I should be using microstrip impedance equations. That's actually incorrect. The reason for that is because, as you see here, there is no ground below this section of the PCB. So that causes a situation where, of course, these traces are not going to have 50 ohm impedance, even if they're the same width as this trace, because this trace is over ground, while these traces are not. So as a result, you can't use all of these equations from Waddle to determine the impedance of these traces. Instead, we're going to put a big X there because we don't want to use these. And instead, you would have to simulate what the impedance of these traces is. You can get a propagation constant, and then you can use your operating frequency F to get the propagation constant as well as the total length of the antenna. So this L right here is going to be this entire length all the way along this section of the antenna. So you can get that data, and all you need here is, of course, the speed of light and vacuum, and then you need the dielectric constant. Normally, this would be written dk, but I've written it as epsilon sub r just because we're doing some rf stuff here. But this would be your dk value for your substrate. So this gives you two important pieces of information. Now, as long as you know this, the propagation constant, and as long as you have some way to determine the impedance of these traces here, then what you can do is you can determine the input impedance of this antenna looking into the antenna from this feed line. So that's important because once you know that, you can determine the matching circuit that you need. And you can do that with a Smith chart, or you can do it with a calculator through iteration, whatever method works for you. So the challenge here in doing all of that is, of course, then tuning this section so that you get the input impedance that you want and the bandwidth that you want. These are basically stubs coming off of a transmission line. If you know anything about RF design using stubs, and we've talked about this a little bit when we talked about quarter wave impedance transformers, stubs and impedance transformers are all narrow band elements. The relative length of this section compared to this section is going to determine the bandwidth of this antenna. How do you tune that section? Well, you can do it through tests. Um, if you have some sort of way to do it manually, that's great, you can do that. You can do it through simulation. Anything like ANSYS, HFSS, or COMSOL will be able to do it. I know that these are expensive programs. I think there's a freeware 3D electromagnetic field solver out there, but I haven't used it. I don't know how accurate it is. Really any sort of simulation tool will be able to figure this out. Should you use a reference design? Well, reference designs can be useful. Just be careful with reference designs because you need to make sure that the dielectric that underlays this antenna in the reference design also matches what you use in your real design. So be careful with reference designs, but you can do it. You can also take a circuit approach. Now the circuit approach is interesting. It's a bit difficult, but what I'm gonna do on the next slide is show you a circuit model that you can use to determine the input impedance. And then through iteration, you can figure out what the bandwidth is. Now, the last point I want to bring up is the relative size of inverted F antennas versus patch antennas. This is a quarter wavelength, and let's just suppose we wanted to instead use a patch antenna. How big is that patch antenna going to be? This is one of the reasons that we might prefer to use an inverted F antenna, because the inverted F antenna is going to be much smaller. We actually have a calculator here on the Altium blog that you can access for free, and you can use this to calculate the size of a patch antenna. So let's just suppose for a moment that we were designing an antenna on a substrate with DK equals four. Let's just say that the outer layer thickness for convenience is 10 mils and we're targeting, let's say 2.45 gigahertz. So we're targeting like Bluetooth or something. Here, if I just hit calculate, you can see that my width and length are pretty big, right? So this is gonna occupy one and a half inches by one and a quarter inches of board space. Now, let's just suppose we take the exact same device and instead we do this as an inverted F antenna. How much space is it gonna take up? 
Well, I take the speed of light, I divide it by the square root of dk, which is two, then I divide that by the frequency, and then this gives me my wavelength. And here's the wavelength in millimeters. Now, if I divide this by four, this is my quarter wavelength. And then if I multiply this by 39.37, I get the length of the inverted F antenna in mils. So this is 602 mils, and that's just the length here. That's the total length. So if this here were, let's say, a quarter of this total length, 150 mils, then the rest of this length would be 450 mils. So we have a significantly reduced footprint in terms of the size of the antenna if we use an inverted F antenna versus a patch antenna. And you can just see that here by comparing these different numbers. So this total length versus this area that you would need in these two different types of antennas. So for smaller devices, obviously inverted F antenna is gonna be superior. Now, there are some things that you can't really do easily with inverted F antennas. One of those things is patch arrays. Now, you can very easily take a microstrip patch antenna and then you can cascade that into a set of arrays. And that's actually what's used in some more advanced wireless systems. It's also kind of the standard that's used in automotive radar. That would be very difficult to do with an inverted F antenna. It would be very difficult because it's difficult to ensure that you have the same bandwidth and input impedance across Across all of those different sections of the antenna and then you lose all the benefit that you get from cascading. That's one of the reasons that this tends to be seen more on smaller handheld devices like an ESP8266 versus a patch antenna. Thanks for watching everybody and um, I hope this clears up some of the design confusion around inverted F antennas. They aren't that easy to design primarily because you do need some simulation programs in order to figure out some aspects of the design of these antennas. However, they do offer some advantages, mainly their smaller size for a given operating frequency. And in fact, their smaller size is one of the reasons that they were commonly used in handsets for a long time uh, before we had some of the more advanced phones that we have today. All right. Thanks again for watching, everybody. Make sure to hit that subscribe button, leave your comments and questions in the comments section, and stay tuned for the next video on inverted F antennas, where we will actually create one of these in Altium Designer. Thanks again, everybody. And last but not least, don't forget to call your fabricator, folks.